Um, last week, just before we open our Bibles together, last week um, John and I were down in Melbourne. Um, John was there for two days, I was there for four. Uh, we meet twice a year as leaders all over Australia and we talk about how things are going and it's always very interesting, isn't it John? Um, just to meet together and, and see how God is blessing our work. Um, a couple of things. Next year you may know that our church right around the world has its once every four years conference called the General Conference Session. And they're meeting at San Antonio in Texas. And um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people meet. Um, Jeanette and I went to one General Conference Session in Holland, uh, in Utrecht, and we couldn't believe they hire this huge, I'm telling you, it's huge stadium, um, which seats, I don't know, 20, 30,000 people. And people just stream in. And it's, it's so exciting to see how God is blessing in all areas of the world. Um, it, it's just absolutely amazing. So that's happening next year. This year we just met for four days uh, within Australia. And a couple of things that are going on. Grenville Kent has been working for quite a few years on a, a series of DVDs called The Big Questions, or The Big Question, singular. Um, he is very concerned, as a lot of Christians, because in Western society, most people have thrown the whole idea of creation and God out the window. Our world came by chance through evolution, and I think many of you know that. But there's a lot of very big problems if you choose to believe that. And, uh, and Grenville is exploring these, these problems. Um, and he's been all over the world. Actually, this week he's in Poland and he's attending an apologist conference where a lot of people who look very systematically at, at evidences for God meet together. And he says it's really, really going well. That series will be ready to, to be given to us by the end of the year, hopefully. Uh, more than Hopefully. And uh, so that's going to be very good. Something else that our church is doing worldwide, we're producing a movie. And you say, oh, this is Adventist church people don't, don't do movies, but we do. It's called Tell the World, and this is actually a movie of the early history of the Adventist church. Um, and I've seen a little snippet of it, and it's really, really good. Um, they actually filmed it in Canada. Um, and they got this this period village that's set up in exactly the same way as it would have been in America when, when our church was raised. And they've got actors in to act, Ellen White and James White and horses and carts and carriages and old churches. And it's going to be a very, very good series. They're telling me that one of our uh, historians, Dr. Alan Lindsay, who has a great interest in these things, they flew him over there to have a look at um, you know, what was going on. And he was standing there, and around the corner came this girl who is acting Ellen White. And they picked someone that looked very much like Ellen White, and she was dressed in the right dress. You know, her hair was done the same way. And Ellen went like this. You know, it really shocked him. He said, my, he said, look at that. She looks just like Ellen White, and he was quite, quite taken with that idea. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens when this movie comes out. That will be released next year at a general conference. So oh, I could spend ages telling you all the great things that are happening around our church, but we won't do that now. Instead, we're opening our Bibles to Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 7. And we are going to notice a story together. I do apologise for my gravelly voice. I probably should be in bed enjoying the flu, but instead I'm here. Um, that's okay, but we'll cough and splutter our way through the sermon today. Luke chapter 7. I've entitled this, When Two Crowds Meet. This is happening at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when things are really going well. He's called the 12 disciples, he's given the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, he's just going around the country telling the good news of the kingdom of God. And everyone is so excited. And so we come, oh thank you, that's great. And so we come to this story in Luke chapter 7. 
says this. I've got it on the screen for you. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. I want you to imagine this. The Bible says quite clearly it's a large crowd. And I want to imagine who is there. Well, first of all, there's the disciples. How many of them are there? Twelve. And they're excited. They've been called to a special ministry. And they've been with Jesus now for a little while and they've seen the things he's done and they're excited. As well as that, there are the women that cared for Jesus and the disciples. Now, if you just quickly come over in your Bible um, to Luke uh, chapter 11. No. I'm trying to find where. The, yeah, Luke, Luke chapter 8, just the very next chapter. It tells us who these ladies were. It says, The twelve went, were with him, verse 2, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Boy, she'd had an interesting life, hadn't she? Now she's following Jesus. Next one. <coughs> Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and my Bible says, and how many others? Many others. Wow. So here's these women going with Jesus. Now, I think this must have been okay in this culture. Because today you'd say, hang on, what's going on? I don't want my wife traipsing all over the countryside with this fella, with 12, 13 men. That's not right. But it must have been okay for them to do it. And so that's what they did. So we have the disciples. We have the women. We also have people who had been healed and who now believed. They were just so excited. People who had accepted Jesus' teachings, witnessed his miracles and knew that he was the promised, the promised Messiah. And lastly, I would suggest that there were the curious onlookers. People who weren't quite sure who he was, but they want, didn't want to miss a thing. So here's this great big huge crowd with Jesus. I want to suggest that they're happy, they're joyful, they're excited, they're exuberant, they're expectant, because they are with Jesus. And I want to call these people the Jesus crowd as they're sweeping down into name. As Christians, you and I belong to the Jesus crowd. Amen, church? We do. Why? Because Jesus is with us through the presence of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Because angels are with us to minister to us. Because of Jesus, we already have eternal life. Because of Jesus, we have power to overcome the temptations of the evil one. Because of Jesus, we have a constant connection with God through prayer. As the Bible says, my friends, if God be for us, what? Who can be against us? With God, you and I are a majority. Because we belong to the Jesus crowd. Our sins are freely forgiven. All the riches of heaven pardon me, have been poured out for each one of us. That's why when you and I walk down the street, we can stand tall and look people in the eye because we belong to the Jesus crowd. We have nothing to fear because God is with us every step of the way. I love this quote from Steps to Christ where it says, a life of Christ is a life of restfulness. Hmm. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there should be an abiding, peaceful trust. Your hope is not in yourself, it is in Christ. Your weakness is united to his strength, your ignorance to his wisdom, your frailty to his enduring might. So you are not to look to yourself, not to let the mind dwell upon self, but you are to look to Christ. I don't know about you, but I get myself into trouble when my eyes leave Christ and go to someone else or to myself, right? You find the same thing. But when we look to Jesus and his strength and his power and his might, everything works out eventually. But I tell you what, a life of Christ is a life of restfulness. Come on, you say that. You must be joking. 
doesn't really work like that. In the same book it says this. You may be perplexed in business. Your prospects may grow darker and darker and you may be threatened with loss. This is when the bad times come, when it's tough. Do not become discouraged. Cast your care upon God and remain calm and cheerful. See that? Pray for wisdom to manage your affairs with discretion and thus prevent loss and disaster. Do all you can on your part to bring about favourable results. Jesus has promised his aid, but not apart from our effort. When relying upon our helper, you have done all you can except the result cheerfully. So we trust in Jesus and we let him lead us. Look at this. Cast all your care on him, for he cares for you. Now, I don't know each of you personally, but I'm sure that there are people here today who are struggling with life because we all know what life's about. Let me remind you of these promises. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things, Jesus said, will be given to you as well. Great promise. This one must be in, the, in a million homes around this country. Trust in the Lord, what? With all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That is a promise to claim every day. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. See, when you don't fix your mind on God, you lose your peace. But when you do fix your mind on God, peace comes. So this is what it means belonging to the Jesus crowd. Let's come back to the story because there's another part to it. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother and she was a widow and a large crowd from the town was with her. So here's the second crowd. There's a large crowd with Jesus coming down into the town. Now there's a large crowd coming out of the town. And obviously this is a funeral procession. And it's a very sad funeral procession because here we have a widow saying her final goodbye to her only son. You think about that. She'd already lost her husband, not quite sure how he died. She'd lost her husband and now her son was in an accident. Was it a sickness? We don't know. <coughs> but he's gone and here she is saying goodbyes at the funeral. She has nowhere to go. Who's going to look after her? What's she going to do? Not quite sure. So here is the second crowd. They don't have Jesus with them. They're grieving and sad. They're crying and mourning. They're overcome with grief. They're despairing. They're hopeless. I'm going to call this crowd the broken crowd. I'm going to tell you what, my friends, how many people there are who belong to the broken crowd. When I was a kid, 1960s, way back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, <laughs> I remember the Beatles came to Australia. I tell you what. You remember that, Trevor? You went to did, yeah. George Harrison, John McCartney. Help me here. Paul McCartney. John Lennon. And on the drums, <coughs> Ringo Starr. Remember their first song? She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the flip side, <coughs> I need to have a cough, guys, sorry. <coughs> yeah. Speaking with the flu is not good. <coughs> I want to hold your hand and on the flip side, she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, these four boys from Liverpool had everything. They had the world at their feet, when you think about it. <coughs> they made so much money that one of them got a Rolls Royce and had a gold plate. Can you imagine that? They bought these huge, great mansions all over England. They had everything they wanted. But I was interested as a young teenage boy to start looking at their songs and how the words of the songs changed. The first one was about, she loves you, yeah, yeah, I want to hold your hand. 
but slowly they changed. Thanks, John, so much. They changed. And I remember one song about a woman called Eleanor Rigby who died a sad and lonely lady. And then there was another one that went like this. Remember this one called Nowhere Man? He's a real nowhere man sitting in his nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. Doesn't have a point of view. Remember that? Knows not where he's going to. Isn't he a bit like you and me? Here are these four, four young men who had millions of dollars in the bank, and yet they sing songs like that. Here are four young men, no meaning, no purpose, and no hope. They belonged to the broken crowd. You know, you look around the world today and you think, man alive, there are so many people struggling with life. Do you know that five million children die of starvation every year? And the devil laughs himself sick because he's so happy. The broken crowd. So much misery and heartache and sadness in this world. I think of this statement by Henry David Thoreau. Most men and women lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. That's a very sad quote. The song that they want to sing, a song of freedom and joy and meaning, can't sing it because there's no hope. And there are so many people in Port Augusta, people around our country that sing the same, they can't sing because they belong to the broken crowd. They've been sold a lie and they believe it. And it's a tragedy. French philosopher, his name was Albert Camus. He looked, about, he looked about the meaning of life and he said this, why is there something instead of nothing? And why don't we all commit suicide? That was his philosophy of life. See, the broken crowd. Tragedy. So here is Jesus and his crowd sweeping down into the village of Nain. And coming out of the gates is this other crowd, the broken crowd, the sorrowful crowd. What are Jesus' options? Well, first of all, he could have gone another way to avoid meeting the... Oh, he said, I bought this is, let's go around the other way. He could have cleared out. And you can understand why he'd do that. Or he could have continued through the town and just completely ignored the broken crowd. He could have done that. And I've seen people do things like that. Yeah? Or he could have gone up to the lady and said, look, I'm so sorry. Look, you've lost your boy. I'm really sorry. Please accept my commiserations. He could have done that, couldn't he? But let me tell you this. Our God is not like this. Amen, church? When he saw this woman, when he just felt the sorrow and the pain and the anguish, our God had to do something. And I love the way this, this story keeps going. When the Lord saw her, my Bible says his heart went out to her. <coughs> Do you see that? His heart went out to her. If you have the King James Version, it says his heart was filled with compassion. The actual Greek means his, his insides were twisted. He just felt it deep down, the anguish. It was, he just felt it so deeply himself. His heart went out to her. He went up to her and he said, don't cry. Don't cry. This is God speaking here. Creator God. He sees our sorrow and our pain and our anguish, my friends, and he says to us, don't cry. Don't you love that? Don't cry. And then he did something that he should not have done. He broke culture. He, then he went up and he touched the coffin. Now, in his culture, when you touch something on which a dead person is lying, whoa, you don't do that. You see, Jesus many times broke culture for the kingdom of God. You with me? And here he's doing it, and they go, oh, what's he doing? Oh, this is terrible. He's touching, he's touching the coffin. Oh. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those standing carrying it stood still. And everyone's quiet. What, what, what's he doing? What's he doing? And here's the, here's the broken crowd saying, who's this fellow? What's he going to do? 
And this the Jesus crowd saying, oh, oh, he's going to do something here. And they're excited. What's he going to do? And all these hundreds and hundreds of people, they're having a look. What is Jesus going to do? I tell you what, church, they soon found out. He said in his godlike voice, a voice of power and authority, young man, I say to you, get up. Everyone's like, what? what's going to happen now? And Luke records him. Remember, Luke was a doctor. And there are more miracles recorded in Luke than any of the other Gospels. He was fascinated by this, fascinated as a doctor. And he records it. And as he's probably hearing the story, he says, is that what happened? And he writes it down. The dead man sat up. You imagine that. Open his eyes and go. The dead man sat up and he began to talk. Whoa! And I love this bit. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Wow. Jesus gave him back to his mother. All of us have been to funerals and all of us know the, the feeling of anguish and, and, and despair that's in our hearts when we lose a loved one. We know that. Here, Jesus did something incredible. He did it on the spot. But I want to encourage you that those people who have died believing in Jesus, this is going to happen to them one day. Amen? At the last trumpet call, when Jesus, he won't say, young man, get up. He'll say, everybody, wake up. Boom, out they'll come. And the time in between will be just like that, a split second. Dear old Adam, who's been in the grave for thousands of years, say, oh, now, where am I? What's going on? You know, that's exciting stuff. Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. What an incredible story. Now, this is what intrigues me. What happened... Pardon me. What happened when the Jesus crowd and the broken crowd met? The two crowds. I love this bit. The Jesus crowd engulfed the broken crowd. Are you with me, church? Amen. The Jesus crowd just took over. And that's the way it always needs to be. The reason for the sadness was dealt with. They were all filled with awe and praise God. The Jesus crowd grew as more and more people believed in him and followed him. Your sadness is flavoured with hope when you belong to the Jesus crowd. Amen, church? Amen. Yes, we have, we have sorrow, but as Paul says, we do not sorrow as others who have no hope. We have hope because we know the plan that God has for us. When you belong to the Jesus crowd, you cannot help but tell people about Jesus. If we're not doing that, I'd like to suggest that maybe we don't belong to the Jesus crowd. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? We engulf the broken crowd. I love this quote. Oh, we'll have the quote later. You and I belong to the Jesus crowd. We're called to be the light of the world. We're called to be the salt of the earth. We are to infiltrate and engulf the broken crowd to bring hope, meaning and joy. Our lives are to be focused on mission. When we were in New Guinea, we were there for four years. I got a little bit bored. And as my friend John says, my, my wants exceeded my needs. And I bought a, a little yacht, John, just a little baby thing that you could put on the roof of the car. But that was, we went out, that was a bit too small. What can you do with a little yacht? So then I saw one for sale in the local Rabaul newspaper. It was a 40-foot trimaran. Now, a trimaran has three hulls in a row. And it had just been on a great big voyage and the fellow was selling it. And the price was very, very reasonable. I said, oh, wow. So to cut a very long, painful story short, I ended up buying this boat. <clears throat> so here's Andrew owns this 40-foot yacht. I'm a missionary with a 40-foot yacht. How does that work? And anyway, we used to go out in this this yacht sailing to Rebel Harbour, which was fun. But uh, a couple of times we went out to some nearby islands. I've even forgotten what they're called now. The Duke of York Islands. And I remember one trip we went, and it wasn't far, only about four or five hours. 
and uh, we loaded everything on, but I'd left the charts behind, hadn't I? <laughs> and I'm not real good with reefs. I'd actually, you know, met a reef before with his boat, and I'm a sort of, yeah, it'll be right. No worry about it. It'll be okay. So we had no charts. And if ever you've been out to sea, things change a little bit. And I, I, I had an idea where to sail in the Duke of York Islands. I knew there was a... It was when two islands met, you sort of sailed between them, and that's where it went into a nice lagoon where you could anchor. But we left late because the battery on the, on, on, the, on the motor was flat. But we got that fixed and we eventually left. And away we went. And we were getting closer to the islands and it got dark. No charts. I said, what am I going to do? Maybe we should turn around and say, no, no, we, we'll be right. We'll make it. And so I said, Lord, you're going to have to help us here. We, I just don't quite know where to go. Now, there was our family and another family, two families on board. <coughs> so we're sailing. And I said, Lord, show us which way to go. And I tell you what, as soon as I prayed that prayer, I looked again and there was this light. This light just appeared. And I said to everyone, see that light? We're going to steer toward that light. So we pulled down the sails. We turned on the motor. We, we sailed toward the light. I said, I'm not worried about what's on that side or that side. I'm just going to steer toward the light. And sure enough, we went on, and I could see that there was land on that side because we had a great big searchlight on the boat, and we could see land on that side, and land on that side, and rocks over there, and rocks over there. But as I followed the light, it was clear. And soon we saw what the light was. Someone had one of those pressure kerosene lanterns. Remember the old pressure ones? And they'd put it on a hook on the end of a little jetty. There was nobody there except the light. We went on and made anchor and everything was fine. I was just so grateful. I've never forgotten that story that happened to me. That we are called to be the light of the world. And you may not realise it, but people watch you and notice you. True? They know. And if you and I live for Jesus, is this thing going all right? If you and I live for Jesus, we will attract people to him. We are to infiltrate and engulf the broken crowd to bring hope, meaning and joy. Our lives are to be focused on mission. Now, here's a bit of a dream. I'm thinking now of the whole state of South Australia. You imagine this with me. If 100 disciples or 100 church members were bold for Jesus and allowed God to use them to win just one person for God each year for five years, and if each of those people in turn brought one person to Jesus for five years, we would have 3,100 new members. That's <coughs> when just 100 people decided that we have 300 members in this state. 3,000, I'm sorry. <coughs> if we just had 100 of the 3,000 do this, that's what would happen. That's exciting. That's just one person for God, one for every five years. Now, let's have a bit of fun. Let's say that if they wanted to, decided to do two. So here are 100 church member disciples winning two people for God every year for five years, and then each of those people in turn bringing two people to Jesus for five years. Do you know what it would be if that happened? Want to do your sums? Have a guess. 24,200. You know, the laws of multiplication. If we all do our part and be bold with Jesus. I think for many of us we're too timid. We're too frightened. And I want to encourage you to be bold for Jesus. To live for him, to speak a word for him. Um, how do we do that? Here we go. I've got seven little ideas for us to think through. Number one, intentionally target people you know who have a heart for God. <coughs> All of us have friends. 
And I'm sure there must be some people that we know who are looking for hope and meaning in their lives. We intentionally target those people for Jesus. Yep. Number two, broaden your friendship base. Number three, wisely share the hope that is burning in your heart. Four, for those of you who are really brave, door-to-door work with the Beyond series. I know church members who knock on doors and they have five homes where they share the Beyond series. If someone says, well, I don't need any more, they go knock on more doors until they keep the five up. And we have people now who are ready for Jesus coming. They've accepted Jesus because someone is brave enough to go knocking on doors. Wow, that's pretty cool, I reckon. Program intentionally at the church. In other words, you, you have intentional programs at the church that you invite everyone to. Soak all you do in prayer. Number six, asking for wisdom, strength, power, and a love for all. Number seven, keep your own relationship with Jesus strong and alive. And this is the quote I want to share with you. Like when the love of Christ is enshrined in the heart, like sweet perfume, it cannot be hidden. I remember working in an office and there was this lady that wore this very, very nice perfume. And as soon as she opened the door and came to the office, I knew she was there. You know why? Ah, she's here. Because I could smell it. So this is saying, when the love of Christ is enshrined in the heart, like sweet perfume, it cannot be hidden. Its holy influence will be felt by all we come in contact. The spirit of Christ in the heart is like a spring in the desert, flowing to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. I'm done, my friends. Jesus said, come to me and I will make you fishes of men. There are many of us that we have the fishing lines, we have the fishing rods, we have our hooks, but we're not fishing. If you want to catch fish, what do you need to do, church? You need to go fishing. And I've done a bit of fishing. You don't catch fish every time, but you keep on fishing and you keep on fishing. You might have to change the bait. You might have to change the hook, but you keep on fishing. Whether it's with a line or with a net or with a spear gun, you keep on fishing for Jesus. And my friends, when we do that, God will bless us. And people will rejoice with us because they've left the broken crowd and they've joined the Jesus crowd. May God bless us as we think about these things is my prayer.